Good morning, everybody. A very happy Women's, International Women's Day to you all. And uh, welcome to ODI for the first of what I suspect may become an annual event, uh, ODI's Gender Day. We are hugely excited um, to have a fantastic lineup of speakers today, different um, keynote speeches, the first of which we will be hearing from in a minute and panel events um, presenting some of the information that we feel is so critical to catalyze change. My name is Claire Malamed. I am one of the directors here at ODI. Um, we're great believers here in the power of information and discussion to catalyze change. And of course, on International Women's Day, we're thinking particularly about the kind of changes that are needed to overcome the barriers that too many women still face in their lives and to create the kind of opportunities that we all want to see for women and for girls to lead the lives that they want to lead and meet their ambitions. We've got, you'll see an agenda on the seats in front of you. We'll be hearing today about some of the different aspects of that. We'll be hearing um, about the importance of thinking through the non-work aspects of people's lives, childcare and domestic work, the particular barriers facing adolescent girls as they try to make their way in the world. We'll be hearing from some inspiring women in power about how women taking political office can help to overcome some of these barriers and change, the, change lives for other women. We have um, a full house in the room, which is fantastic to see. We also have several hundred people watching online. Welcome to all of you. We're delighted that you were able to join us. The discussion is critical. We'll be hearing, we'll be hearing lots of presentations. We really want to keep the discussion going. We'll have plenty of time for questions in the room. And let me also encourage you all to keep the conversation going with and for people who are outside the room by tweeting. The hashtag is Gender Day. I think you can see it here in front of you. So without further ado, let me welcome you all again and hand over to our Executive Director, Kevin Watkins. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, it, it's a huge privilege, um, Hella, for us to, to, to have you here at uh, ODI. And I think all of us um, in the UK, you know, we often think of Denmark as a country that is light years ahead of us in, in so many things, in quality of life and gender equity and others. And, and, and that is true, that if you look at, um, just take one indicator that we looked at recently in a report that we did uh, with, with uh, Tam O'Neill, one of our researchers here, that Denmark ranks about 20 places above the UK in terms of female representation in, in, um, in Parliament. The bad news, I think, for Denmark is that you, you rank 20 places below Sweden, which uh, I, I know is uh, um, and a really, really long way between the top performing country, which is Rwanda, as it, turn, as it, um, as it turns out. And I, I think we also maybe sometimes forget that um, it, was a, it, it took almost a century between when women got the vote in Denmark and your election as the first female prime minister of, uh, of Denmark and before that as the, as the first female leader of your party, the Social Democratic Party. Um, actually, Hannah Wiebeke Holst, who I've never read, but I've, uh, I, I have seen quoted in Politiken, said when, when, you, when you were elected, let's not forget that Hella Thorning Schmidt didn't become Prime Minister because she's a woman. She became Prime Minister despite being a woman. And that's in Denmark. And I, you know, I think it's a very apposite and, and uh, relevant observation. Both in opposition and in office, Hella championed causes which are very close to our hearts here in ODI, the, the cause of uh, reducing inequality in Denmark, of uh, setting a bold ambition for renewable energy uh, in, in, uh, in, in climate change and in many other areas. Um, th there's another piece of really good news, which is that Hella earlier this year was appointed CEO of Save the Children. And um, so she'll be living in London, which is for, you know, very, very good for, for us and for, for all of us. But <laughs> I, I think also uh, for the cause of advancing 
child rights because there's so much that's been achieved for children over the past 15 years. You know, we've seen these dramatic reductions in child mortality from 10 million to 6 million um, since the turn of the millennium. We've seen this big decline in the number of children out of school in, in gender, um, and gender equity. At the same time, if you just look at the gap in school attendance between girls and boys, there, there are something like 10 million missing girls in the world's education system. Yeah, that's something that we can do something about. And we can also do something about the children who have been left behind because they happen to have been born to poor parents, they happen to have been born into an ethnic minority group, or they happen to have been born female. And the the issue that we're all discussing today is how do we advance the cause of gender equity as one of the motors of human development over the years ahead. And I really can't think of anybody better, Hella, than for, for you to kick us off for the day. So Thank you're you. very welcome and over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kevin, uh, for that lovely uh, introduct introduction to, uh, to me. I'm extremely pleased to, to be here. I haven't actually taken over my role uh, at Save the Children International yet, but it seems an appropriate place to start, and uh, certainly also an appropriate day uh, to start uh, my work, my new work. As we speak, we have a situation where every 10 minutes, somewhere in the world, an adolescent girl dies as a result of violence. Every 10 minutes. Every year, over 1 million girls under the age of 15 give birth, and complications during childbirth continue to be the second highest cause of death for adolescent girls. Violence, health, and access to education are all standing in the way of girls achieving an equal stake in the world. And if we want to see a planet that is truly 50-50 by 2030, only 15 years away. We need to start changing these numbers, these stories, and these girls' futures. In the past quarter century, I think we can say that we have witnessed extraordinary social and economic girls for uh, economic gains for millions of people in developing countries. In many cases, uh, these gains have been made by tackling gender disparity. For example, the gender gap in prima primary education has largely, largely closed now. But we also know that millions of children and adults were actually bypassed by the progress towards the 2015 de Development Millennium Goals. In too many cases, these people were bypassed because they were girls and women. And unless we learn from the past and do a better job of tackling, uh, tackling gender-based exclusion, we will limit our future impact and repeat our past failures. Today, we mark International Women's Day, the first International Women's Day since the creation of the Sustainable Development Goals. And we all start with positive intent. And unlike any, unlike any previous development framework, the SDGs set out a clear, integrated framework to combat gender discrimination and, re and realize the rights of women and girls. That's a good thing. But we also know that intent counts for very little unless it is translated into action. We must act to remove the barriers that continue to prevent millions of girls from surviving, learning, and being protected. And we can change the way things are. When we look at these things in Save the Children, we are particularly concerned about three 
critical barriers that we have to look at. Violence, child marriage, and women's and girls' lack of a political voice. First, violence against girls. Violence is experienced by everyone, by boys and men, as well as girls and women. But girls and women are subjected to a particular form of violence which, which are used as ways of entrenching gender-based exclusion. Take an average 15-year-old girl in the Amhar region of Ethiopia. She faces an 80% chance of having undergone genital mutilation and as a result faces long-term physical damage and major health risk in childbirth, to say nothing, of course, of the psychological damage that she might face. This is not a small, isolated problem. Harmful practices such as female genital mutilation continues to affect over 100 million girls every year. And every form of violence th threatens to prevent girls from realizing their individual rights. And every violent act for which the perpetrator escapes accountability only adds to a culture of impunity where violence is tolerated or even encouraged. We know that adolescent girls are particularly vulnerable at a time where she makes the difficult transition from girlhood to womanhood. Often, this is the age where girls are first subjected to sexual violence, when collecting water or firewood, or traveling to school. And schools, which should be a safe haven for these girls, can themselves be places of danger when school teachers abuse their position. And it is believed to be one important factor in girls dropping out of school, even though it is, of course, difficult to quantify. And that is at the very point where we know that the social and economic gains for girls uh, and the, the returns to, to the individual girls is at the highest just when they drop out of school. Secondly, we need to look at child marriages. The overwhelming majority of marriages under the age of, five, uh, under the age of 18 involves girls. And we have 15 million girls affected every year. We know that many laws have, many countries have laws that prohibit child marriage, but often these laws are not enforced. And in some cases that happened last year in, in Bangladesh, governments are attempting to lower marriage ages for girls. And in some contexts, such as amongst refugees in, from Syria right now, child marriage is on the rise because this is seen as a way of uh, bettering the girl's economic situation if they get married off. Child marriage matters. It matters because it denies girls the opportunities of being children. But it is also a major obstacle to future health, education, and a girl's long-term economic prospects. Of course, a child marriage typically results in pregnancy. And a child bride is much more likely to die in childbirth and is much more likely to see her own child die in infancy. Often she's simply not physically ready to give birth and she is not likely to have enough knowledge or what should we say negotiating power in her marriage to negotiate family planning, family planning that could mean that she could better space her pregnancies. And even when complications during uh, childbirth doesn't result in death, 
child brides are disproportionately vulnerable to other lasting and dangerous health problems, such as uh, obstetric fistula, which, which it can both be physically agonizing, but also can lead to thousands of women basically being ostracized by their own communities. We know that access to quality education is one of the surest ways of breaking the intergenerational uh, cycle of poverty and achieving gender parity. We know that uh, the longer a girl stays in education, the more likely is it that she grows up healthy, secure a livelihood, and have healthy and educated children of her own. We know that that makes a difference. So for that reason, it is doubly concerning that child marriage is one of the biggest factors in girls dropping out of school early. In sub-Saharan Africa, uh, only two out of 35 countries have actually achieved gender parity in education. If we want to close this gap, we have to end child marriage. Thirdly, women and girls are often denied the voice in the family home, in the communities, in their countries. The, the voice that can challenge and change the norms. The norms, the behaviors, and the policies that hold back, back girls' and women's opportunities. Childhood is a wonderful time. And childhood also provides windows of opportunity that can break the circle of poverty. These windows often occur during times of transition in a, child, in a child's life, including the first thousand days of a child's life when, we, uh, when the threat to survival and nutrition is most uh, acu acute. During the period from five to nine, when children enroll into school and when the formal learning is decided, and of course, in adolescence, when children are at the greatest risk of early marriage and dropping out of school. If we want to make use of these windows of opportunity, girls and women need to be empowered as social agents of change themselves. Because no one knows the impact of discrimination better than those who experience it every day. And that is why we must make formal spaces at community and national level where women's, women and girls are heard and listened to. And as development organization, we must design our programs with girls and women so that they can identify solutions that are relevant to their context. I believe it is only by changing this public conversations and by changing the mix of people involved in those conversations that we will create an enabling environment for change. An environment where parents are as likely to keep their daughters in schools, schools as their sons. Where gender-based violence is no longer tolerated and where girls are allowed to complete their childhoods before they marry. Next month, we in Save the Children are going to launch a new global campaign. We have called it Every Last Child. And it aims to tackle the barriers that exclude millions of children from progress towards 2030 targets for survival and learning. Over the next three years, we will be pay, 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 pushing to secure three guarantees, fair finance, equal treatment, and accountability. These are guarantees that we believe will are needed to ensure that every last child, regardless of who they are and where they live, can survive and thrive. Everyone in this room knows that this is a cause that is much bigger than any one organization. 
much bigger. And if we want to see sustainable improvement in the lives of girls and other excluded groups of children around the world, we must build a dynamic movement for change. We must engage communities, including, including men and boys as allies and agents for that change. We must convince governments, business, and religious and community leaders that exclusion of girls is not only an urgent problem, but also a problem that can be fixed. And we must secure the changes in laws, in budgets, in policies that can drive, but not only drive, also lock in social and economic gains. Today on International Women's Day, we must show these future women that they have a right to a life free from violence, to an equal education, and to health and well-being. And by committing to these three goals, we will put into motion the changes needed for global development. And together, I believe that we can catalyze revolutionary shifts in the lives of women and girls. Thank you. Hannah, thank you. That was a fantastic overview of the, I, I think, the level of ambition that you're going to be bringing to Save the Children as well. So thanks for getting off to such a great start. So um, let, let me go straight to the floor. For, uh, I'm going to take questions in groups of three or four. Um, the, the shorter you can keep the questions, the more questions there will be. So, it, it, so if you keep them relatively short and um, say who you are and which organisation you represent. I know it's early, but... <laughs> OK, well, I'm going to kick off then. Yeah, you do that. <laughs> the, the, the thing I wanted to... I, I, you know, that, that was a fantastic overview that you provided of, um, you know, what in many ways, you, you know, it's not a crisis necessarily in the law, you know, because the laws are there, both yeah. internationally and nationally, but a crisis of compliance with, with the law. And, and I guess there are two parts to that. There's... You know, there's, there's one part which is about, you know, you, you mentioned early marriage, that, you know, if, if governments actually enforce laws on early marriage, the profile of marriage around the world would look mm. very different. But then there's a normative component as, as well, which you also described, the, you know, the attitudes that push girls out of school and, and into early marriage. I, I just wonder, as, you know, as head of an international agency with deep roots in the South but still seen as a northern agency, of how you envisage tackling that, that sort of normative mm. challenge, the, you know, the ideas and beliefs, if you like, that underpin the problems that you were describing? Well, I think you, you put your finger to it because you're absolutely right that in many countries, in many countries, you have the right legisla some right legislation in terms of child marriage, for example. Uh, but because of cultural and norms, it is not accepted, and it is, it's, it's accepted that you don't follow uh, uh, this kind of legislation. What do we do? I tried to say a little bit about it in my speech because I think it is important that we understand that we can't come from, a, from any agency and try to change it from the top. What we need to do, and that's why I think the political um, enabling of these girls and women are so important that in their families, in their communities, in the political lives, in their local or national governments, that they get involved. That they get involved, that they have a place where they can have a voice and get involved. So that's one thing. The other thing is that we have to get community leaders, often men, religious leaders, involved as the agents of change. They have to be part of, of creating these, uh, these fundamental changes because you can have as many, as much legislation as you want in a country, for example, about child marriage. But if that's not how it's done in each village or in, in each uh, household, then you, will re then, then you will have absolutely no uh, advance in this uh, area. So community leaders need to be involved but mostly 
girls and women, they need to have a voice. And a voice doesn't do just come with being part of the political uh, debates. It's also a voice you have in the community and basically also in the family. Okay, thank you. Um, I have another question I would have asked, but I'm going to give you another opportunity. And there we are. Now we have um, front row. Hi, my name is Kerry Smith, and I'm from Plan UK. So I suppose my question is about um, seeing this as a universal piece, as, as within the, the SDGs, and kind of linking the, the kind of vision um, on tackling violence against adolescent girls um, internationally, but also domestically within Europe, within uh, developed world as well, and including uh, the lack of voices of women and girls in politics and kind of um, spaces of authority here as well. And I just wondered how you how you see that part of um, the kind of gender discussion and, the, and the, the need to create gender equality, tackle violence in order to achieve the 2030 goals, but how, you know, actually in the UK, we have lessons we can learn from Rwanda or from other places um, in terms of looking at, you know, things that worked and violence um, against adolescent girls in our own backyard and also abroad and how we kind of take that forward. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, too long. Um, hello, Caroline Harper. I'm the head of the Social Development Program here at ODI. Um, my question is about the rights agendas. Um, as the head of Save the Children, um, you will obviously be uh, behind the child rights agenda, but we know that the agenda for women's rights often comes into conflict with the child rights agenda, or has in the past, and can be occasionally divisive. Um, and I just wondered what your th thoughts were on what might bring those agendas together. Mm. Um, both of them perhaps have some common issues uh, when you're dealing with structures of patriarchy, but there must be ways in which we can unite them rather than allow them to continue to divide. Thanks. And uh, there was another one on, on this side of the room, please, in the second row. Uh, Thank you very much, uh, Madam Prime Minister. Uh, my name is Nancy Baraza from Nairobi, Kenya. And um, I come from a country where you can't say that, uh, that women do not have power. I think women are quite empowered. Mm -hmm. uh, they enjoy a lot of space now in view of the new constitution, uh, highly educated. But something like female genital mutilation, which we thought we had done away with through legislation, through the constitution, and through um, programs towards attitude change, is, uh, th there is a resurgence of it. And the perpetrators are the powerful women, the powerful mothers and the powerful girls themselves, now going back to FGM. So I don't know what your approach would be uh, for a society like that one. Can you explain it? Why is it happening? Uh, we don't know why it is happening. So you cannot say it's because women are not empowered, no. that, that girls are denied space. That is not the reason. So we have the law, we have the education, we have the empowerment. So what is the problem? But why are these women saying, when you ask them, these empowered women that, that take their own girls through this procedure, what will they be answering? No, no they, they don't do it publicly. It, it, is, it is a secret thing. Mm. Uh, probably what I'm wondering about is your approach. Uh, I, I, I don't think you can have a blanket ap approach. Uh, to, to societies in Africa, because I think it differs from yes, country to yes, country. Yes. In Kenya, certainly, yeah. it's not because of lack of empowerment. It's not because of lack of, of political, political power or lack of the law. I, I don't know what, what, what programs you would have for a country like Kenya. <laughs> okay, we're not going to ask you to legislate for Kenya <laughs> right no, at this no, moment, no, but... No, um, leave that to the Kenyans. Do, do you... Want, do you um, uh, do you want, yeah, sure. uh, yeah, I would do you want to, to take yeah. the, the first uh, two questions first as well? To, um, the first one, I didn't, ca I didn't give, you, give you no plan. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay, uh, so it's more about yeah. the, the violence that's happening. Yeah, I, I got girls. the question, I just didn't get your name. Yeah, okay. um, uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, you, of course, we can't 
in our part of the world go and tell people exactly what to do. And I'm fully aware that in and that we have our own problems that we can learn. I mean, it is interesting uh, that uh, we have more women in Parliament in Rwanda uh, than in many other countries. Of course, it's because they have legislation about this, which is inspiring as well, because we always ask ourselves if we want to re uh, have gender parity uh, in, in Western countries, do we have to uh, get, go, go to legislation uh, to have that? This is an ongoing discussion in many uh, European countries at the moment, not quite unresolved, because uh, there's a lot of opinions uh, about this. But I have no doubt whatsoever that some of the most advanced African countries, they will have more women in business, uh, in, in banking, in financial sector, uh, than uh, at a certain stage because they're moving very fast. As you were saying as well, Kenya is a country that is moving very fast. And if we are, if we are clever, uh, we will try to take in their uh, experience uh, as soon as possible if, if uh, we can. The next question I find extremely interesting because that it cannot be so that there is a, a difference between fighting for children's rights and women's rights. And I've tried here today because I had to, that was my task today, is Women's Day, but I am uh, working for children to do just that, to pair those two agendas. And I think it is very easy, particularly in this area, because I was, I was talking about, first of all, we now have the Sustainable Development Goals that for the first time, for the first time ever, it is quite remarkable, and we have to stay with it for a little while, for the first time ever, gender is really there. We have a development framework for the world, and gender is clear, and it gives us a, a guideline or a target that we can all work towards. That is quite impressive, and I think we should celebrate that today on International Women's Day, that that is uh, what, it, what uh, has happened. And what I was trying to say today is that exactly by understanding that some of the violence and uh, neglected rights for girls happens at the time where they transition into womanhood, I'm also saying that there is, for me, there's no contradiction between fighting for these girls' rights to survive, to get quality education, to live free of violence, to not get, in, get pushed into um, child marriages. For me, that is the same struggle, same fight that we have to have for women. Because these are just, girls are just uh, are people who will be women very, very soon. And by tackling that and understanding that a lot of the violence that children, girls are subjected to is actually happening because we want to keep uh, girls uh, not having t so many rights. I think that is the key to understanding that fighting for girls and their rights to a better life with quality education is the same as fighting uh, for women. And for, for us today, I think that's an important uh, message. Thank you, Helen. I'm, I'm going to take one more round of questions. Um, so I'll start over this side now and then work towards the centre. My name's Emily. I work for INASP. I'm Program Manager for Evidence-Informed Policy. And I'm just wondering if you could comment on the role of accurate data and statistics um, in this sector. Um, for example, we're working in um, Zimbabwe, where recently there were three different maternal mortality rates mm. released by the government in the same week. Yeah. Um, in Uganda, um, Development Initiatives has done some interesting work and has criticized, uh, has kind of called into question um, the national stats on deaths, um, which aren't being collected um, as robustly as I think they could be at the mm. moment. And that has obvious consequences, as you said, for people in those countries being able to come up with appropriate solutions um, for these issues as they look on the ground. So I'd just be really interested to hear your comments on how you think we can strengthen that evidence base. Um, uh, thank you. Thank you. And um, right behind. I'm Annam Day from Social Development Team and Chronic Poverty Team here at ODI. Um, I've been involved in some work recently on anti-discrimination, particularly around women's political participation. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the literature is, is very much of the view we've done quite a lot on descriptive representation. We've got women in all sorts yeah. of political spaces, but that hasn't necessarily led to transformation. And one of the issues is about do elite women represent the voices of the poorest women, can they effectively also then overcome inequality? So I'd be interested in your reflection mm. on that. Okay, is there any last questions in the centre? Please. 
Uh, microphone and, and just right here. Okay, and then uh, I'll take one really short. Which, which question, sorry? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, because I start asking the questions. Um, hi, my name is Catherine Yant I'm from the Departments of Global Health and Sociology at Emory. I actually just wanted to comment again on the notion of linking child rights with women's rights. And I think social and behavioral scientists have demonstrated very well that adversity in childhood is closely linked and predictive of adversity uh, in adulthood. And so I think utilizing um, longitudinal approaches to make the linkages between rights denied in childhood predicting uh, rights denied in, in womanhood is extremely important. So I just wanted to commend that comment. And just a second quick comment um, is an appreciation of recognizing that the experience of child marriage at the individual level um, is very much a reflection of um, collective practices that occur within communities. And so just an, an encouragement of the need to empower communities concurrently with empowering the rights of individual yeah. girls. Yeah. Thanks very much. Um, so, the, so there's, th there's three questions there. Hello. So, what, there's one on um, data and these data gaps. You know, the, I, I think the figure is around a third of children in the world are not registered at, at birth in developing countries are not registered in birth, and a lot of the data that we have on um, maternal mortality isn't really data at all. Yeah. It's uh, imputed yeah. numbers. So it, you know, just uh, from a safe perspective, I yeah. guess, it would be really interesting to get your, your take on that. The second question on the role of elite women as representatives of marginalized and excluded um, women. And then the, the third question, which was out on, on these links from um, childhood into adolescence. The, 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 I'm not sure if you feel you've answered Nancy's question. That we will have an opportunity, Nancy, to discuss it in your session, actually a little bit later. But whether there was anything additional you you wanted to uh, to raise there. First, you're absolutely right that I I didn't quite come back to the to the Kenyan question, uh, and that's because I think you are more of an expert than, than I am, and that's why I was asking you what if, if you had got any closer to understanding what is happening when you revert. Uh, to, to practices that for a long time has been discussed and you thought were, uh, were, were going down. And, and that is what, I mean, that is important question because it also underlines that of course we can't have one size fits all uh, to countries that are extremely dif uh, different uh, and where the women empowerment is extremely different. And I don't have the answer to that. You probably know much more, more about it than I do. How do we understand and how do we cope with a country that has left some practices and now they are suddenly returning? My best answer uh, is that it cannot be done without the male involvement. It cannot be done without uh, religious leaders, community leaders being involved in this because it takes the male community to also take a clear stand on these issues. And I think that if there's, there's still, there, there's no stand on this from the male community led by community leaders, you will end up not changing practices for real. Maybe for a while, but not for the, the long term. So I think in terms of uh, female genital mutilation, in terms of child marriages, it will take the male community to be part of, of changing uh, this. And that also brings me to uh, the other question of I'll come back to that, to the data uh, issue. This is an issue that we have everywhere. I mean, I have been prime minister. I worked with um, ODI for many years. It was something that, something that Denmark has uh, been, uh, where we've been uh, achieving very good results in this area for many, many years. And data is a big issue. When I do this speech today, uh, I look at what we have. Um, I look at, and you saw I had some figures, uh, but some of them I was scared to say. One of the things we, we know is that uh, adolescent ch children tend to not go to school because they, are, they, they experience abuse by their own teachers. Do we have figures for that? No, we don't. But there is, uh, there is uh, some talk, I would even say, I wouldn't even say evidence, that this is actually a real a real issue when, when the kids, uh, children, uh, young children, uh, girls drop out of school. We don't have the data. 
what we are using now is, of course, the available data. UNICEF is a big, uh, is a big player. Uh, World Bank is a big player. But we all have, a, I feel, a responsibility to make sure that we have the right data, because only the right data will show us uh, whether we make progress um, and uh, whether we, in 15 years, and 2030 is only 15 years away, have made the progress that we talk about here. I, unfortunately, don't have the uh, uh, answers to the data, but I think it is a very important question. Do we have the right data, and how can we imp improve them? And the last question about, um, well, we have political representation uh, in, in many countries uh, of women, but they're elite women not representing uh, other women. I think that's always going to be the case, that it will be the most educated uh, women that take up these positions and, and go for it and are first movers in this area. And that is why we can never settle. We can never settle just for having political representation. It is not enough. You can have as many 50-50 rules in political representation as you want, but it might not even change anything. And if we want to see real change, we have to, in our programming, and say the children can't do this alone, our common programming, we have to put in that we need to enable girls and women in their community to be part of the conversation. And we mustn't think that if you change things at top level, it will suddenly trickle down and all girls' lives will be, will be different. It won't. We have to all have community organizers that can help us do these things. We have to get involved in the communities, and it has to be part of our programming that we try to change these things, because that's the only way where we can, in a serious way, give girls and women a voice in decision making. Many of these decisions that we are talking about, many of these issues that we are talking about, they don't take place in the public sphere. They don't take place where people can see it. As you were saying, it takes place at home. Child marriages, uh, female genital mutilation, violence against uh, uh, girls, it takes place in the, in, in, at home. And unless we change close communities and the thinking there, both by um, uh, girls but also by, uh, by men and boys, we will not change anything. So one thing can't be the only answer. We have to have real changes of minds and hearts at community level and it has to be part of the way we plan our involvement um, in trying to change the world. I want to finish off saying, first of all, I'm very happy that I could be here today and participate in the discussion, but I also want to leave with a, a message that I think is important. First of all, we have to treasure that we now have a framework that we have to work, where, where we can work. And we also have to think that what we're talking about here is not something that can't be achieved. We are not sitting around here talking about going to Mars or something like that. We are talking about something that can happen. And we have to take one step at a time. It has to be quite focused steps that we take. But what we are talking about here and the rest of the day is thing, uh, are things that can happen if we are not peop enough people that work together that, to make it happen. So thank you very much for allowing me to come today. It's been very, very good to be part of this discussion. Thank you, Helen. I just want to say th that, that was a fantastic combination of um, high ambition and, and hard realism about you know, what we need to do to deliver on the goals. Um, one of the things that I was struck by listening to you, that you know, if you think about the sustainable development goals, in the end, it's just a framework. Mm -hmm. And it's up to us to decide what happens with it. And there is this wonderful language in it about leaving nobody behind, which is reflected in the SAVE campaign that you, you outlined. And many of the issues that you touched on, if you take child marriage as an example, that child marriage is coming down, but it's not coming down for the, for the poorest girls. And, I th and the same with girls who are out of school. It's increasingly the most marginalised who are out of school. And I think those three areas that you highlighted, you, that, that first of all, how do we secure compliance with the law for the most marginalised people? That, that's a tough thing to achieve. How do we put in place the policies that redistribute opportunity in the direction of the most marginal groups? And I think above all, how do we build the movement, you know, the coalition and the partnerships that can 
because if you take the great social changes that have happened, they haven't happened because technical experts have framed the SDGs. They've happened because people have got onto the streets, worked together, researched together. And so you know, we're, we're really excited, no doubt, about the prospect of working with you and your colleagues at Save the Children. And again, thank you for getting us, us off to a fantastic start thank today. Thank you. Thank you.